Hello, everyone. Thanks for attending session 10, building a, bull a bulletproof business case. Thanks, thanks for attending. Um, this is hosted by AT&T, but what our, our content and what we intended to do today was to share with everyone best practices as if you're obviously state employees or government employees and you have a concept in mind based around mobility, whether it's building a mobile app for a program that you work for or for your agency or adding new devices, whether they be iPads or tablets to a particular group and what the next steps and best practices would be on how to get that from a concept to an actual successful project. So uh, last year we did uh, something similar where we showed um, a software tool that we have free of charge to our government uh, customers and prospective customers that give them the ability to create an ROI uh, in a spreadsheet format so you can understand the financials of what it takes to, um, to move a project through and what the cost benefits will be doing something like that. So what we wanted to do this year is follow up with uh, a panel, an esteemed panel, of um, technologists with the state of California that have have that experience firsthand and have run multiple projects through from concept to success, successful completion. So um, I want to thank uh, today, introduce our guests or, of the panel. Uh, we have on the far left here, Tim Garza, IT Director for California Natural Resources. Uh, closest to me, Nabil Ferris, Deputy Director and CIO for California Department of Public Health. And in the middle, last but certainly not least, Lena Pruitt, uh, Lena Luna Pruitt, uh, Chief Infrastructure for Lottery. So thank you guys for attending and sharing your insight. Um, my name is Juan Lao. I am a technical solutions consultant for AT&T. Um, one of my focus areas is for mobile applications consulting, and I've been working with uh, for AT&T with the state of California for about four years now, helping agencies uh, conceptualize and design and build mobile applications. The format today is going to be, uh, Nabil's going to stand up and share with us one of their successful projects. It was a mobile application build that he did with one of his programs. And then um, really from there on out, we're going to freeform it a bit. So we're open to questions that we have from the audience and talk about best, best practices. I'll try to keep the, uh, the conversation flowing. And, um, but we, we want to open it up to all of you and if you have specific questions or need specific advice regarding an idea or a concept that you've been working through your mind or something that, that comes up after Nabil's presentation, please don't hesitate to ask, raise your hand. Unfortunately, we don't have a microphone for the audience, so we're gonna ask you to, to use your best voice possible, and then um, I'll do my best to repeat your question and get your question answered by the panel. So, thank you very much. Uh, not bad. Hello. So thank you for being here. So <clears throat> it will be a little bit difficult to entertain the after lunch crowd. And I have to tell you, I'm not into stand up, stretch, do this, do that. But this is what I'm going to do. <clears throat> I know you are spread right, left and center, but I'm going to focus on you. If you will doze off, I will ask Vitaly from EDD to ask you a difficult security question. <laughs> Vitaly, raise your hand here. Okay. If you are really, really nice and pleasant and ask me easy questions, I will ask my dear friend Rolandia from OTEC to be really nice to you in your dealing with technology department. How about this for a deal? <laughs> so my dear friends, thank you for being here. So um, I'm going to mention a couple of companies like uh, Gartner and IDC, but this is just to use them as a reference. I'm not saying uh, anything in terms of endorsement, but these companies I worked with in public health and they are serving us well and we have good partnership relationship. Hence, um, Gartner said that the mobile app technology and the mobile apps will occupy the top two uh, ranks or two uh, areas in any CIO or a company technology. The top two. Okay. Where the hell is the picture? So what's this? 
this is just that's that's background you didn't tell me about this thing yeah i'm sorry we have the ferns you asked for the ferns we got the ferns that's what you get from at and t <laughs> you introduced me to maria there <laughs> yes maria you need to come and sit here <laughs> okay thank you so and the smartphone in particular they shipped and this is before the i uh, i6 the iphone 6 they shipped about one and quarter billion units all over the world, whether it's Droid, whether it is iPhone or others. So the, the expansion of the smartphones is non-deniable today. It's something that we live with and we need to deal with. And also we know about the concept, internet of all things, that you have the internet and everything is joining the internet so you can access the internet by PC or whatever, uh, uh, iPhone or a smartphone or something like this. So, From the people which got surveyed, 90% of them, they carry cell phones. So the cell phones actually is a misnomer, it's mobile phones, because I think the cell phone, we stopped this technology since the 90s, right? We don't use cell phones, actually it's mobile technology. So 90% of the people surveyed, they carry mobile phones. 58% of them, that's close to 60%, they do carry a smartphone, more intelligent phone. 35 of them, they carry something like uh, 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 electronic reader for, uh, whether it's under iPad or Fire or Kindle or something like that. 45 of them, they have tablet computers, whether it's iPad, whether it's Surface or something like that. Are we good? This is a very interesting stat that uh, from the people who surveyed, 61% that the gender is men are carrying phones and 57% of the women surveyed are carrying phones. So the ratio in my mind is very close, almost the same. Regarding the age group, you will start seeing the gap. So uh, the old geezers like me, which 65 and higher or maybe 70 and higher, I don't know, I lost track. 19% of us, yeah, you know, this is what happens, you know. 19% of us carry mobile phones, 50 to 60, 49%. That's half of us, 30 to 49, 75%. And the young generation, like all of you, no exceptions here, it is 83% of you are carrying smartphones and mobile phones. Look at this income. It's very interesting to know that people with income, annual income, combined or individual, $50,000, this is gross pre-taxes, 50% of them, a little bit more, 53% they carry phones. So the priority for the people with $50,000 income after taxes it becomes whatever, that the smartphone is very important because really many of us we no longer have landline. Who has landline? This shows your age people. <laughs> Put your hands down. Put your hands down. You know, so the reality, many people today carry the smartphone. They don't really carry landline. It's no more landline. Okay, so let me brag about our department because we are always looking for very good talent like Vitalia and company to come and work with us. Public health, our job is to keep you healthy, you and your siblings and your family. Nowadays, our mandate from this six points that you have is we are fighting Ebola. So we are dealing with Ebola. We don't have Ebola in California. This is not what I'm saying, but we are ready and we are focusing a lot in prevention, working with hospitals, which hospitals going to do this. So our focus for the past month became Ebola response. Would this make sense? We have about 214 lines of business in uh, public health. One of them is WIC, Women, Infant, and Children. And this is serving about one and a half million tender strata of the society that we supply them with the nutrition value. It's a very important program. We deliver about uh, uh, a little bit less than $100 million a year in food assistance. 22% uh, are the ages 14 to 49. The 75% are kids, are children. So we are doing really magic for this group of people. And also 78% uh, of these participants who are the kids are living with their parents. So the relationship is very important. So Eddie here, Eddie, how are you? and his team, part of Yolanda. Uh, yeah, Eddie leads the technology over WIC, so he serves the program. So Eddie deployed the mobile app for WIC, which is really awesome mobile app. 
because we arrived to the conclusion that many of these women carrying a smartphone, they don't have landline. So he deployed this app that we can look at it, it's in the gallery, in which women understand about WIC program. It serves as an outreach for WIC. It can calendar appointments. It does initial eligibility. It gives you an idea about what food you will be eligible for getting. And it's actually, uh, when you put in the calendar, it will remind you by your appointments, the dietitian appointment, when you go to the local health. So it's really pretty comprehensive tool, but Eddie also has a vision to advance it even more and deploy it on the droid beside the phone. Uh, very quickly, I will uh, cover uh, WIC. This is the application, and I think it's outside. When you deploy it, you have a few areas. And for example, you can get direction from this place, whatever the place is, to the closest WIC agency. How many are you? We have 500 of them, 600 of them? 650 scattered all over the state that the mother can say, okay, I need help from the closest one. So it can pick on it and it will give her direction to go there. And then from there, it will show my WIC, her appointments and what time and who's going to be talking to her. It will show us what's the authorized food list that she can get because WIC program by, by the USDA, the feds, they say this and this is part of it, this and this is outside of it. So also there's eligibility part as I shared with you, a simple one, very high level about guidelines for being part of it. So uh, the questions actually with your permission will be spread all over us here, you know. And what I want to make sure you can, the reason we are covering WIC, it's besides the fact it's a great service to use it as a straw man, as a model for us to carry on the discussion. Would this make sense? Okay. This table, what's questions? The difficult ones, we decided to go to Lena. <laughs> and the easy ones goes to Tim and I just collect the credit. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Nabil. Um, our panel, the reason we chose the panel that we did was because both <coughs> Lena and Tim also have ex similar experiences in creating mobile applications. Again, it doesn't have to be simply a mobile application discussion. It can be anything around building a mobility project and a business case around that. Um, one of the things that we thought would help, uh, hold on here. You need trying to, to click a slide. Up? Yeah. Want us to call there we go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Ouch. Tim, that's going to come back around. Um, so uh, thanks for the help from the booth there. Uh, one of the things that we thought would help generate uh, conversation at at and we have a mantra that um, we're not going to, it, we're, we don't even want to be involved in, or we're not going to have success in a project unless we positive, positively, positively affect uh, one what we call peers, which is an acronym that stands for productivity, image, expenses, revenue, or security and safety. So the idea behind that is it's pretty much a waste of time uh, in generating a project unless one or many of these these peer points are addressed from a positive perspective. Um, and so uh, or before this presentation, uh, the four of us met and we discussed peers and how it relates specifically to the government space in the state of California and creating a project and some of the pitfalls that, uh, that come from that and the, the roadblocks, obviously there's many. And uh, the government is, as everybody knows, and we won't get much argument, is probably a little bit far behind from the mobile app creation business as the enter enterprise space is and it's because of those obstacles. So. Um, let me open the floor to the room here. Does anyone have any specific questions for the panel regarding an idea, concept, a roadblock, anything at all that uh, might help them further some of their, one of their projects along or one of their ideas along? There we go. Uh, did you develop any policy before developing the whole strategy? What was the last word? Strategy. strategy. So, the I, Correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think what I heard was, um, do you develop the policy before you develop the strategy? Is that right? 
I'll take it. Okay, um, one of the issues with mobile applications or, or a mobile program is that it's still pretty new in government. And it's hard to create a policy around something that you haven't seen, don't know how it's going to be fleshed out in your organization. I think in taking a look at this uh, peers, the productivity and the image, the expenses, the revenue and safety, one of the things that has to happen first to create that mobile strategy is you have to identify what is the business of your organization and how are you going to sell your mobile program, your mobile application to the business? What is in it for them? So, um, you know, the policy, I think, uh, sometimes just in practice is a little bit behind the strategy. There's a generally a business champion that is out there um, that is looking for a new way to either con connect to constituents or to increase security, increase safety, increase the services that your program um, provides you know, to your constituents. So the, the policy uh, generally, in, it's been my experience, tends to lag a little behind the strategy. The strategy generally has to come first. You have to know what are you trying to sell or who in your organization is going to be able to fund or invest in what it is that you're trying to do. I don't know if that. Sure. Um, we're talking about building a business case, so you really you don't have a project yet, right? So really, you need to look at it as can you market it and can you package it? That's what a business case is. So when we talk about executive sponsors, a lot of times in a project, what you're really trying to enlist initially is an investor. In the private sector, you're listing an investor, someone that understands that this idea will uh, yield dividends to either the, uh, one line of business or the enterprise. So you need to really address it that way. The other thing is if you address these investors and start with a policy, it's dead on arrival. If you start with the concept of security, it's dead on arrival. You've got to talk to them and what's in it for them as an investor. Policy is at implementation before you implement. Idea has to be packaged and marketed a little differently. So you need to address your executives and your investors a little differently than, and don't treat it like a project. So that's why I agree with uh, her that the policies really should come as part of your implementation, not part of your thought process and, your, and, and selling your idea. Tim, could you define for us what your vision of what the difference is between, for example, a project champion would be and an investor for, well, for the group? Yeah, I think and we which all... Which is more important. Yeah, we, I mean, we've all learned about PMBOK and project management and you know you need strong executive sponsorship and that's all true but before you even have a project you have to have someone that's willing to invest in your idea or your thought right so you need to understand who is going to benefit the most from this mobile app or this uh, mobility app or this digital idea and so what line of business and what is in it for them is it going to generate revenue? Is it going to generate business benefits? Is it going to generate goodwill to their constituents? Is it just something that they need to do to be competitive? So the difference between an executive sponsor and a project, the project's already basically been endorsed. An investor is somebody that's going to help you promote that to get it into the project state. It's going to help you uh, fund it, going to help you promote it to others. So that's what I talk about an investor. I think in government, we talk too much about in government terms. I think we need to talk more about in marketing terms when you're talking about a business case. Thanks, Tim. Nabil, did you want to add? So, um, gentlemen at the back, tell, us, tell me your name. Your name. Jade. Jade. So Jade, you asked a very, very good question, and I think uh, we are, uh, I really appreciate what you said, Lena, that sometimes is lagging. So in public health, really, we focused on the strategy before the policy. I always say, Jade, you know, I always say, Nabil doesn't know what I don't know. I just don't know what I don't know. So the strategy for us, whatever mobile app we are doing, the data has to be public, and we are just creating a tunnel, another way to to deliver the data for the citizen that we are responsible for 38 million or 40 million. So this was paramount for our, uh, what we are doing, not to, to avoid uh, security, 
because we have very good security in the application, but it's much easier to put out data which is for public consumption. Would this make sense? Like we have another application in, each, uh, in which it talks about uh, infectious diseases. This is published on our website and it's public data. So our strategy is to take it and package it and move it to the smart and the droid. Would this make sense? Thank you for asking. Thank you. Is there another question from the group? Jessica has a question. Jessica. So I heard mobile device management to start that off. Did you want to speak specifically on how that's tied in as well? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll try to rephrase the question, but essentially how are we juggling all the different uh, mobile operating systems when creating an application and handling the, uh, the device management of those applications? Is that safe to say? Okay. Don't start up again. <laughs> okay. Um, what we've done at the lottery is we've kind of separated the two. Mobile device management and providing a mobile device to our employees, we handle in a separate manner than creating the applications for our players. Uh, because there are rules. There is um, structure already built into how you handle mobile devices. You know, we've, um, most agencies have had Blackberries and got rid of them. That is a mobile device. Uh, and so there are already established uh, rules that you must follow in how you're going to provision these devices, how you're going to control them, how you're going to secure the data, the organizational data on them. And uh, applying mobile device management has been um, kind of a, a, an easy transition uh, in terms of making sure that you're able to wipe the device, that you're able to track the device, that you have policies in place for how these uh, devices are handed out to employees. Uh, so that, that one is kind of easy. The application uh, that is provided to our players and the strategy on securing those applications, that is the new world that uh, is still you know, being formulated and, and we still um, have had to take a look at what is the business asking for you know, from us what is the data? Is it publicly uh, uh, available data, or do we have private data? Um, as government organization, uh, you know, the lottery still has to abide by all of the rules. There's plenty of laws out there that say, if you have personally identifiable information, what are your obligations under that? Um, so, you know, it's uh, those two, even though it's all mobile, it really comes down to a provisioning of equipment as one and making sure that employees are um, properly in enabled to carry out their business function, but that you're securing the e property of, and the data of the organization versus uh, co connecting to your our players for the lottery um, in a different way. I no, don't know if that answers the question. It, Lena, is that... What, what stage in the process do you have to start considering those things, though? Is that, if you're, um, if you're trying to put a project together to build a business case, is that something you should worry about very early on, or is that more of a, uh, something that comes later in the actual project phase? <laughs> no, uh, it, it's part of the um, requirements of whatever it is that you're trying to do. So if you are going to be deploying um, a new mobile device, the security and the rollout of that is got to be considered because you can't afford to have a mobile device with uh, confidential data leave your organization and be lost. Um, you know, so in the planning stages of uh, the actual implementation, you have to consider how are you going to secure this, what are your controls, um, and, and uh, yeah, 
that would be planning. Mm -hmm. Questions? We don't want to get Nabil back up here. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have one? I don't see. Oh, there we go. I think you have to look at when you're when we, that statement there it's really around what we call business engineering if you look at how most uh, government entities do work it's input outputs you deliver you either get something from the citizen or you deliver something to the citizen so think about how we do it today in the state of California how many of you are still using paper-based entry forms I mean majority I bet you still right nobody well because I can tell you I can go half of your departments and they're gonna make me fill out a piece of paper <laughs> so, I mean, so, so inefficiencies are looking at things to streamline the business process. If you take away the physical constraints of a paper, so when you fill out a piece of paper, that has to be delivered to somebody else, right? Somebody reviews it, somebody keys it. If you can move that physical to more of a virtual entry point where you're putting it on a, mob a mobility app or mobility entry point, then you can move those business rules and those validations up, and now the system can problematically do it versus having someone do it. So, so these are called, in a business uh, re-engineering, these are non-value-added steps. You can automate those steps, thus you remove latency, and by removing and process latency, you create efficiencies. So when you talk about a return on investment, as you look at your mobility strategies, you really have to sell a return on value. And, and what is it worth to cut a process down by 20 to 30 percent and deliver that? What is it worth to eliminate not just uh, someone doing that work, but someone doing that work three times? There's three different entry points. So that's what we meant by that statement. Does that make sense? So sometimes an antiquated process can be something as simple as having citizens dial into a toll-free number and ask a question, right? And so we're doing a lot with working with agencies and just simply using text messaging tools so that um, software can essentially respond to questions. If you get, if somebody has to dial an 800 number, your agency's paying for the duration of that call. If they're on hold for 15 or 20 minutes, that's, that's a cost that's going to the agency and a cost that's eventually rolling up through the citizens. And there's a lot of call centers and a lot of toll-free numbers that all the agencies use to communicate to the public. Um, if they get the same question 500 times a day and you can create a software package where all they need to do is text the question in uh, and, and get an automated text response and solve 450 of those calls, um, that in and of itself it, it, you know, affects that, that peers mantra that we spoke about earlier with regards to expenses. It can be as simple as that. It doesn't have to be a mobile application. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with other agencies who, have, um, who are trying to communicate with uh, high school students and getting student aid, and they're trying to figure out why uh, the high school students aren't responding to their emails, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and you have to tell them, you know, High school students are text messaging and doing it. They're almost beyond text messaging at this point. You have to keep up with them. They're not sitting around reading emails anymore. Uh, emails are too long, <laughs> right? They, they want to be community. So if you're going to remind them of doing something, sometimes a text message is the best way to do that. And it goes back to Nabil's presentation regarding um, families in low income that d might not have home computers. They might have a smartphone, and they probably have a smartphone, and that is their home computer. That is their laptop these days. They don't, they don't have a DSL line. They don't have a cable modem. They use their wireless carrier and their smartphone to communicate. And um, if, if you're going to communicate with the public that way, you need to have a solution around text messaging as well. Take advantage of that. I don't see it. Oh, here we go. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the the question is, um, how do you move with 
mobile ideas and mobile projects, but not leave behind uh, the areas of the public that might not be as apt to to um, adapt to that or adhere to that, the older public, right? So that's an urban legend. Um, statistics have shown that actually um, the older generations are more adaptable right now because they can do it from their home. Um, they've run um, at PERS when we first had this, uh, when I was working at PERS, this argument came up all the time. Well, if we do that, if we automate this, if we put that on the web, if we go e-business, then what happens to our older retirees? What we found out through statistics and reach out programs is that's not a problem. That's an urban legend because it's more convenient. It's more safe for them to be able to conduct business from the safety of their home. Um, if, they, if they're at an age where they have difficult at night or they have difficult driving, it's more convenient for them. So, uh, so it's really not a problem. I think it's a problem in our minds. So it's kind of an urban legend, I think. And statistics will bear that out when you look at like AARP, who are the biggest users of online insurance, online claims and stuff like that, it is the senior citizens. So, so I think it's just something that we've always had in the back of our mind and we need to move past that because th that generation is way past it. Uh, I mean, my grandma, she's a tweak freak. So. <laughs> <laughs> what would she say if she was here to, uh, here to see that She'd comment. Throw a shoe at me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. How will um, the question is how will e signature help replace some of the paper processes and what are your thoughts on that? I shouldn't have started this, Jessica. Jessica doesn't have any more questions. She's out. Okay. So, so this is what we are doing in public health. Outside of the mobility, I bought a workflow it's called Pega Systems, because when I reflected about, we have about two hundred fifty-eight applications running uh, on uh, enterprise applications in CDPH, and this is a big load for 214 programs, big load for IT. We also have uh, about uh, 86 of them are mission critical. That's a lot of mission critical applications. And many of them are written in database. And uh, this is a great product, but they no longer teach it at the schools. So I don't have stream of people coming with the knowledge of database sitting on the mainframe with the natural language. So I acquired, well, before I say I acquired, we reflected upon our applications that we have. The majority of the applications that all of us, we have actually some sort of a workflow. It starts here, it gets handed here, it gets approved here, it gets denied here. So I acquired software called Pega Systems. It's coming out of, uh, of uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And actually it's a, it's a very good software. It's so easy to configure the workflow. So I'm going to put in it about, I don't know, Jessica, probably close to 100 licensing applications. We have about 157 licensing applications. We license doctors, we license nurses, we license buildings, we license machines. But part of the PEGA framework, I'm feeding into it the credit card and this is the first time for public health to start accepting true credit card. And thanks to the people working with DGS to allow us to work with the, one of the two companies. We appreciate this. And also the electronic signatures. The electronic signature, I started to dig a little bit in the law because I always get told, talking about the urban lesion, it has to be a wet signature. And it's even worse, it has to be blue so the people will see it. <laughs> You know, and I, I believe this all my life. And then I, I, I just, I don't have a way to, make, to, to turn this into an electronic format because they need a wet signature. Vital records that we have, we have it in public health from birth to cradle and what's in between. We manage this in public health. So many things require the wet signature. With this bigger framework is able to accept some signature, actually a lot of them, but I had to go and uh, I don't want to say challenge the law, challenge the interpretation of the law. 
you know, because the law, it was written, uh, I don't know, 50 years ago saying you have to have a signature. And for 50 years, you have to sign with a blue ink, okay? But there is nothing really says it has to be what signature. Some of them says what signature, then we are working on changing the law, so to speak. Uh, but the majority of it, we are really accepting more and more credit card and uh, electronic signature. Uh, I'm sure in a point of time, Jessica will get challenged. Uh, but this is why we have about 34, 35 lawyers in public health, <laughs> you know, so thank you. Uh, Lena has a great answer. <laughs> What, what exactly are you calling an electronic signature? What are you doing? So, so we have a digital signature, actually, that we take your signature and we break the image into algorithm. It's a, it's a, it's a proprietary software, thank you, you know, uh, that we acquired. It takes your si regular signature that you sign, you break it, and create a hash out of it, and we store the hash. And the software will be able to reverse this and come up, uh, voila, you know. Okay, thank you. Um, looks like we have another question. I, I, I completely agree with Nabil. Uh, the biggest challenge has been the legal interpretation of what is a valid signature. And uh, you generally do have to work with your internal legal counsel and try to, uh, uh, you know, work with them to see if their interpretation is, is going to change. Okay. Yes. development platforms. So uh, just so I understand, you're, you're asking about mobile development platforms and if any of these panelists are using those and, and what are they using? So um, we have 33 departments um, within the California Natural Resource Agency and the departments have not standardized on one platform. So it's, um, they're looking, w they chose different platforms amongst themselves to maximize the two things, the skill sets that they had and also the things that they thought they could uh, sustain and recruit for. So we have a variation of where we use the, the native compilers but we also have a, a number of things like Excel and other things that can do um, can do the basically uh, compiling outside of the native. Um, and then we do also use uh, HTML5. So those are across our various departments. Tim, does does that how much of that depends on what the actual application is doing? Would you say is that? So, so I, you know, a lot of these questions that are being asked are about the, the underlying technologies. And I think one of the things we have to kind of remember is when we talk about uh, mobility, we're really just talking about another extension of what you're trying to do for your business. And if you think about it, you're, a lot of us are already doing things on websites, right? A lot of the things, now what we're just, we're just trying to extend those out into different mannerisms and compile them or basically um, construct them to be more conducive to how somebody wants to work. So the difference between somebody, not just a citizen, but like say a field technologist. You know, remember when field technologists would take out clipboards? Well, now they take out tablets, right? Do you think they're capturing different information on the tablet than they're capturing on the clipboard? So I think we have to remember that in a lot of cases, we have a lot of the fundamental technologies that are already behind the scenes, policies, security layers. We've classified our data about what can be exposed, what can't be exposed. Now what we're trying to do is we're trying to socialize a different method, whether it's for the citizens, constituents, or ourselves. And I think that's really what we're talking about, how to, how to, how to construct this stuff from a socialized way versus from you know, a heads-down computing mannerism. So it didn't probably answer your question, but I think one of my things is when we talk about digitizing and you know, riding that digital dragon, we have to remember it's just a different form of information that you're presenting. It's just a different way that you're presenting it. And if we turn it into a science project, we're gonna get further and further behind as government. Exactly. Yeah. 
What we've used as the lottery really depends on the particular mobile application uh, and whether or not it's going to be internal uh, you know, or external. Um, when we're dealing with internal applications for our employees, that's much easier to manage and uh, we can just go ahead and leverage uh, some of the native tools uh, to present that in a different format. Um, we do have uh, the tablets that we've deployed to all of our sales force. And so we do have internal systems that were already somewhat webinized and we are just leveraging and making sure that we, our technology stays up to date um, so that we can present the internal data in a way that will be readable for our employees. Um, for the applications that uh, we're putting out to uh, for our players, that, you know, we have to try to meet um, the needs of our players. So we're definitely supporting an iOS and an Android version, but uh, the lottery is relatively small, and so we can't support every single flavor of Android. And so you just have to pick um, what, you know, will cover most of your players and uh, move on from there. Please tell me your name. Ben. ben. Thank you, Ben, for asking this question. Uh, are you focusing on the programming mainly? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, 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 Ben, what we do in public health, actually, uh, it's very similar to what Lena in the lottery and Tim in his area, they, we do. It depends on the application. If we are building a native mobile app, we utilize, I think it's uh, the SKD for, uh, for the Mac. And this is our development area. We have three, four Macs, very limited, in which we develop and test and deploy. If we are going to do just a regular mobile app, we scrub the website, so we go with the JavaScript, HTML5, and uh, we store it actually on little database tied to the mobile app. So we are pretty clever in this, you know? So it's lightweight and capture the image, and it then, poof, it goes away as soon as you leave that. Thank you. I think Mark had a question. Yeah, go for it. Mark? Yeah, this might be a little off topic, but um, this goes back to the data you shared in the real start about the younger generation growing up with smartphones, having smartphones, coming into the workforce. As, as the workforce starts getting younger in your own environments, how are you addressing the needs of this younger workforce for the for a bring your own device? Yeah. So, Mark, thank you for asking this question. That's a leading question, actually. Can we repeat? Because you worked with me with public health, and you helped me deploying a lot of uh, uh, a lot of a lot of uh, smartphones. You know. So, really, uh, the department. Uh, I'm, I'm tempted to tell you, three to four years ago, we started gently to encourage the family members, the four or five thousand employees, that to bring your own device if you are interested. At this time, I was moving the department from the crackberry, so to speak into uh, smartphones. So, so many of the friends, the family member, the, our fellow employees, they embraced and many of them shied away. We have about uh, uh, 990 in which uh, issued, uh, 720 which is issued by the department. And I think I have about two, 300 units that I'm supporting on the droid level, Android and on the uh, iPad and bring your own device, you know, outside. So, so the reality is I need just to get my security team because I have HIPAA required environment. I have the Office of AIDS and this is super ultra sensitive and all of us will respect this in which uh, some sensitive strata of the society, you know, they are, we manage their uh, medication and things like that and their information with other data which is open on the open data that I put out about three, four weeks ago for the public consumption, you know. So we worked with the security team to make sure, uh, and I have a great security team, they really don't say no, but they say this way is hard, it's better if you will do it this way. And we started to do actually brown back sessions. The security people come in and educate us about what we are doing and how we are doing. 
And uh, we have a lot of new generation coming, and I was really happy for this. And actually, uh, we have an outreach program with the, we have a great uh, relationship with the UC system. So I have a great program outreach with Berkeley. They invite us when they have an open fairs and things like that for the jobs. Davis, of course. And actually, we went as far as uh, Santa Barbara, actually. You know, they invited us. So while I'm trying to not necessarily directly recruit, but show the beauty and the opportunity that working with the state, you have the opportunity to positively impact 40 million citizens, you know, uh, this makes it really lucrative for some people in which they are interested. So how this is some of the ways that I'm bridging the, bridging the gap. And in reality, all of them, they are coming with their iPad or whatever uh, joined to their hip. So I have definitely to accommodate for this. So, so this is some of the ways that we are doing it. Thank you for asking. What we've done at the lottery is um, we have uh, prepared ourselves to be able to deal with both uh, bring your own device or the corporately issued devices. Uh, it, it, we're still kind of waiting for the policy to be uh, developed as to whether or not organizationally we support people bringing in their own device, but we have uh, acquired a um, mobile device management tool that would allow us to wipe corporate data in the event that the person is no longer an employee or has a need to access internal corporate information. Um, another thing that we've done to kind of facilitate what you know will be the eventual change is we've uh, installed uh, wireless access points throughout our headquarters building and we've segregated the traffic. So we have our internal corporate wireless network and we only allow the internal, um, it, internally issued devices on that corporate network. And we also have a guest network. Um, the guest network allows our employees to sponsor a mobile device as a guest. And so it, with that, you know, we do have the ability to manage how much our corporate and guest wireless networks are being utilized, make sure that the corporate traffic is uh, being controlled through security certificates. You can't um, bring in a non-lottery owned device and plug into our corporate network. But likewise, you know, there are somewhat some controls over our guest wireless network to make sure that we don't have somebody streaming YouTube eight hours a day. Thank you, Lena. I think we have just a couple more minutes left, and I, I saw one question from the front here. Maybe, so I just wanted to add to okay. what Mark was asking. It's not, a, it's not a technology problem. This is a corporate attitude and a corporate acceptance and from the technologist and the people that want to implement bring your own device it is uh, it is getting others to come along and that's back to the policy statement so you know it's been done all over other states so it's, it's about corporate acceptance and getting the lawyers and HR to agree how would we compensate people if they did this, if people are using their own device and they got dropped in a river would we be liable so these are all the questions that technology it's there. Okay, this will be the last question. Questions regarding um, the agency's use of credit cards as opposed to sending in checks and... So, sir, I know we met before, but please forgive my short-term memory. Tell me your name again. My name's Jeff. Jeff, where do you work? Our Resources Control Board. Okay, so, Jeff, I think it will be befitting if you will bring CVS and Rite Aid to sit next to me. <laughs> because today, they said we are not going to accept Apple Pay. And the issue for the state or any corporation is security is one, and protecting the citizen in general, this is very important. So while the private, and that came from the private sector, I work in the finance forever, you know. Mm -hmm. While the finance, our calculation for risk is as such, in the state is completely different. So this is why I will, uh, 
I will offer for your consideration that we are not really behind as much as our responsibility is completely different from making money. So here, for example, in the presentation, we reference return on investment in which Tim referred to it as return on value. So we are focused a lot on the value for Jeff as a citizen versus Jeff who's coming to me as a teller. So we end up being in a place that while we would love to make an impact on the 40 million citizens, positive impact in the 40 million citizens, but also we have challenges in the state of California as a public servants, we are more uh, uh, vulnerable maybe to, uh, to the public opinion for mitigating factors. Hence, our calculation has to be much more meditated than the private sector. Thank you. <laughs> I think you're right. I think in a, not just in credit cards, but in a lot of other uh, digital capabilities that the state of California and government in general is behind. Um, and I think that's because of a lot of what uh, Nabil said. There's a, there's, a, there's a fear factor of scrutiny. You heard Carlos talk about in his uh, keynote that one of the things as government uh, that, well, not in his keynote, but he did a video recently. He talked about what he loves about government, but then he also talked about how hard sometimes it is to work in government. Because in government, sometimes you're over-scrutinized versus you're it, it, not even, you're scrutinized more than the, but the reality is we are behind. And we need to get off our butt and get ahead of the game because it, there's no reason we shouldn't be taking credit cards. Um, Parks, for instance, that works under the resources agency, uh, the governor asks us, well, why don't we take more credit cards? So now we have major issues to not only put credit cards in all the parks uh, places, but to automate the gates. We also now are going to move forward and try to put Wi-Fi out there to generate where more. So we need to move, but we need to be more aggressive because we're behind. So I agree. And by the way, we will take your American Express today if you want to give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's a shortcoming to this panel, it's that we, will, we were only given 50 minutes and we're running out of time, but I can tell from the participation and the questions that this is something we'll have to do again shortly, if, if not uh, definitely next year, and we'll definitely get a similar panel together. On behalf of the panelists and certainly myself, we thank everybody for their attendance today and the participation in joining us between two ferns. Um, uh, all of you have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thanks a bunch. <laughs>